May I have your attention, please? The podcast World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment, is now on the air. May I have your attention, please? The podcast World Awakenings is now on the air. This is World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment with your host, Carl Gruber. World Awakenings is a podcast dedicated to opening your mind, your heart, and your eyes to the fact that the world's population is now, more than ever, awakening to all things metaphysical and spiritual, and just how they play an all-important role in our daily life. So join Carl on this enlightening experience as he interviews metaphysical and spiritual experts to discuss, debate, and delve deeply into the hows and whys of this worldwide awakening. We welcome you to the World Awakenings Podcast. Before we start, we'd like to tell you about a special ebook written by the show's host, Carl Gruber. The Three Pillars, a simple three step process to manifest positive and permanent change in your life. The concise 32 page Three Pillars ebook will teach you how to become a successful and consistent co creator of your life path with the Law of Attraction. Yes, you can manifest the life you truly desire, and the ebook is absolutely free. Simply go to Carl's website, carlgruberlifecoach.com. That's K A R L G R U B E R lifecoach.com. Click on the header title About Me and get the free download today. Carl Gruber's free ebook, The Three Pillars, will positively change your life. Hey everyone, welcome back once again to my World Awakenings, the Fast Track to Enlightenment podcast for this episode number 37. I'm your host, Carl Gruber, and almost three years now since I started this podcast. And in that time, we have had some amazing interviews and discussions with some of the greatest teachers, authors, and leaders in the world of all things spiritual and metaphysical. Now, I hope you've enjoyed the amazing knowledge, truth, and light that has been shared by my guests as much as I have. Now, that tradition continues with today's episode with my guest, Lynn Morell. Now, Lynn has two master's degrees, one in applied psychology and one in applied theology, a DSS in spiritual science. She is also the spiritual director of the Christian Formation uh, and Direction Ministries. Um, Dr. Morell practices accelerated energetic transforma uh, transformational healing. I'm looking forward to hearing about that. A revolutionary approach to transcending barriers and blocks to success, health, joy, and emotional intimacy to reach your full potential. Now, she is also the author of a number of books, including her wonderful new book called Beyond Lovelyville. And Dr. Lynn is a masterful healer who holds a fifth, a fifth degree black belt. I believe it's in Kung Fu. Uh, she'll correct me on that if I'm wrong. And an intuitive with decades of successful entrepreneurship. Lynn, thank you so much for being on the show. What, what an amazing bio you have. Awesome. Oh, thank you. And by the way, I am a spiritual director, but I'm not the spiritual director that started um, the Christian Formation and Direction Ministries. However, I became the founder's spiritual director for a short period of time until she moved. Um, and yes, I'm a fifth degree black belt in Taekwondo, but I've also spent 55 years studying Tai Chi, Qigong, uh, was in China, and et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's just the love of my life because I get to have oneness yeah. um, in that process of being fully present. Well, I'm not going to mess with you with that fifth degree <laughs> black belt. <laughs> I have a feeling it'd be hard to make you angry anyway. It's pretty, it takes a lot to, for me to get angry. And as soon as I do, I go, oh, what's that mirror showing me? Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. It's, it's well, clean every time. It's like mirror, mirror on the wall. Oh, dear Lord, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have another spiritually experienced person here. This is great. By the way, uh, Dr. Lynn, I'm going to let you know my, my uh, uh, cat, Maya, 
which is means illusion anyway, uh, loves to jump up here. She may come and visit us during the show, and since me, she, her name means illusion, we'll just imagine we see a 17-pound cat here, okay? I love that. I hope Maya does join us. Well, let's dive into this. You know, I'm, I'm really, really interested in what you do, but I always like to find out a, a little a personal story. Now, you, you are uh, called a transformational healer. What was your own personal journey uh, that brought you to this point in your life? Well, that's a really loaded question. I would say that I chose my parents and that I was faced with um, opportunities to be traumatized and then overcome them. So I, I had many, many, many um, challenges before I was the age of five, wow. and then lived most of that time with an aunt and uncle who took care of me, sort of. And um, at 17, I ran away because I came from a dysfunctional household, loving people, bipolar, alcoholic, hardworking dad. And um, when my mom had her psychotic break, I was afraid she would kill me. Mm. So, I ran away and I put myself through college, which is an interesting thing. Oh, yeah. And I uh, was doing graduate work when I was a junior because out of the trauma, I became uh, a super people pleaser and hyper vigilant high performer. And that was what allowed me to become resilient. It also stopped me at a certain stage. And I would say in my mm, late 20s, early 30s, I was invited to mainland China. I met uh, spiritual grandmasters and I, I demonstrated the Shaolin Monastery. Yes, there is one. And um, that was the beginning of a real sense of, they recognized me. It was quite interesting. There weren't that many women in the 40 person group, but I was the first one to do my form at, this, at the same place where allegedly, you know, Buddha did theirs. And, and it was that kind of awakening and feeling numb inside unless I was working out or busy. Mm -hmm. So that, that really, as I progressed in the martial arts, I became more and more aware that there was a part of me on ice. And that really began my journey. Interesting. So, so the, your early childhood trauma led you to become a high performer um, to, to a a fault uh, from what I heard you say. Um, and when did you, how did you get into the martial arts into Taekwondo then? Oh, that's, that's really amazing. I was um, the designated chaperone for my younger sister who got everything she wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, my sister-in-law bowed out. So I was determined that I would go study judo, which was my first start. Three months later, she quit. My parents withdrew the ride and the funding back in 65, it was a whopping $35 a month. Mm. I wasn't about to let it go because I found I was like a fish in water. And so I, I ironed, I washed floors, I begged, barred and stole rides. And by the third month, I started teaching the men in the class, the beginners. And so my tuition was paid. And um, that's how I started. You know, and I was chubby, couldn't chew gum, walk a straight line, bookworm, find me on the roof with a ladder pulled up with a tree across the street. And I found this, this sense of self that I could actually throw these grown men. And, and the more they resist, the easier they fell. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for quite a few years. I even earned, when I ran away, I worked my way through college and I taught judo as a, a one credit course. So I got you know, scholarships and things like that. But it was the idea of that I had um, dominion over my own body, that nobody would ever touch me again, that I would be strong. And I really, I mean, I've done lots of things with the martial arts where I've disarmed people with guns and, you know, they were loaded, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that martial arts as a 15 year old helped me run away when I was what, 19 or 20? And then I worked my way through college. I married my childhood sweetheart. And um, it just, I love to learn. And, and you mentioned transformational. My transformation as a martial artist actually allowed me to move forward and begin to look at those issues that I had. Anger, definitely. You nailed that one. I would say anger was the thing that kept me alive for a long time. 
until it became my jailer, not my my uh, guard. Yeah, it works for a while, right? Yeah. But then... then yeah, exactly. It didn't work anymore. And you can't, and, and I was nationally ranked as a karate champion in the U.S. through the uh, uh, AAU, but I couldn't be angry when I fought because you'll lose. Yeah. Anger takes you out. It is one of the biggest distractions and murderer of potential that I know. That is a beautiful statement. Thank you for saying that. You're welcome. I imagine it's actually an eye opener for a lot of people just to hear you say that. Say that again. So anger in the early stages is your protector, but it becomes a killer of your life and your potential because it takes over and it's no longer you. It's this program that gets bigger and bigger and bigger with every time you have an angry outburst. Didn't quite say it the same way, yeah. but it does kill our potential. I think that can even apply to nations. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, we're all one. We think we're all separate, but right now there's such againstness. Nobody's allowed to have the dignity of their own opinion. There's no longer discourse about, well, tell me why you, you know, what is it that makes you believe that? Well, my parents believed it. Well, who told them? And then they begin to see the habitual societal programming. And for me, it took quite a few adulthood traumas for me to really zone in on the fact that if I wanted to be someone who changed this planet and took all those things that happened to me and used them as, as compost to grow wonderful things in my own life and then help others. And so, you know, there was a time, but 13 month period, I've mentioned this in other places where I, I offered everything that I had to be of service, not a great prayer. You know, Lord, you can have anything that keeps me from being a full service. Well, for the next 13 months, I lost everything that I valued. My home burned down, my, my, that was my business and my husband's. My husband died in a plane crash. My daughter got taken by her dad in a custody issue. Um, I was field audited by our, the IRS, sued by Social Security for something I reported, got really, really sick. And I, I was just decimated by these six week intervals. And at that point, at the ground zero, it's like serendipity showed up, grace showed up. And I, I, it's literally the new me rose from the ashes because I refused to let those things define me. And, and all my martial arts through the years allowed me to get up one more time than I fell. So I, I truly had an opportunity to be bitter or to be grateful. And I chose the practice of gratitude because I feel better when I'm grateful. And I don't feel very wonderful when I'm in bitterness or resentment or anger or victim for that matter. You know, I, um, I, I haven't had nearly uh, those kind of experiences like you. I'm so grateful for that too. Um, in being a, a marathon runner, I've run uh, 78 marathons. Oh. And so I understand about falling down and getting up, brushing off and just keeping going forward. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, my, my, over the last couple of years, my main guidance from spirit is I hear them say, Carl, just keep moving forward. Don't look back. Yes, keep moving right. forward. Don't look back. And looking back is a trap. Mm. Because our memory always distorts what's back there. It, it's an amazing way of taking an issue and, and morphing it and, and moving it so that it becomes an impediment because the reflection and looking back mm -hmm. takes us out of the now and out of our desire for future. Mm. And I was, I was guilty of that. I actually had a brain injury at one point. And when I finally got treated, well, I've had multiple brain injuries, but when I got treated, the first thing the doctor said to me was, do you have a hard time staying in the present and seeing the future? And I said, yes, I don't understand why I reference everything to the past. It makes no sense. He goes, well, that, that part of your brain is the part that got injured. So mm -hmm. I have to work extra hard. And I got some exquisite integrative treatment, which really has helped tremendously. So I've learned that those so-called handicaps 
have become my strengths. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like anything can become a blessing. I don't care how bad it is. And people that are in the middle of it right now, they're saying, what the heck are you talking about? But having chosen the path of finding one little thing to be grateful for, that kept my gratitude engine going. Mm -hmm. And gratitude precedes blessings. So I may have lost a lot of stuff, but my own personal belief was the more grateful I was, the more I would have to be grateful for. In the way we understand how uh, the universe works and the law of attraction, the more you're grateful for by law, more to be grateful for must be sent to you. Exactly. And talk about a beautiful cycle. So, you know, I, I have a, a question, you know, I, I got much of my information here from your website and, and I really want to ask this, your website states that you do not have to suffer to release pain, to remove the blocks, to live your best life. How does this occur? Well, it's what I discovered by working with myself. I, I call it accelerated transformational healing mm -hmm. because, you know, I set out to be a clinical psychologist, but it was clearly not my route. Spirit took me where I am precisely. So what I discovered that if when we work with the subconscious and unconscious, people go with PTSD to therapists and they're encouraged to tell their story, which really further builds neural pathways. And what I do is I actually use algorithms. I have them count out the issue. So because I'm aware and pretty awake, I can access people when I have permission, just like a PC Anywhere program. And so I'll say something like, well, what happened when you were five years old? I'm just curious. Did anything happen then? They'll say no. And then like two seconds later, one lady said, oh, I got hit by a car. And, and then another one, yeah, nothing happened to me when I was nine. But he was babysitting his three-year-old brother who he also got, they just happened to both be hit by cars, different people. And that trauma was buried so deep and the shame and the guilt so I just had them release trauma number one, trauma number two, trauma number three. Our unconscious, our subconscious, the levels of consciousness that we have are so, they know our issue better than we know our issue. And it's, I call it a curious experiment, Carl. I look for the places where there's a disturbance in their energy field. And then we look at that particular issue through the numbers and then what will happen is frequently people, some people have, have had dry heaves just by counting one, two, three, four, five. Really? Wow. And they can't remember that 10 comes after nine. And this and is because all that learning. trauma, the past trauma is being released finally, being like released. A, a bubbling up from below the surface. Exactly. And I, I like to say that we're rewiring their operating system because these traumas, no matter, everybody has trauma. I don't know anybody. They can be baby traumas. They can be big traumas. One person's huge trauma could be somebody's what? You know, it's like, what's bad about that? Because your trauma is your trauma. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's actually, in my perspective, our way of gaining awareness, overcoming setbacks, doing service for people, and ultimately recognizing whatever breathes us by whatever name we call it, is behind all of this. See, you've really got me thinking because I got hit by a car when I was about six or seven. <laughs> There's no accidents for the stories I tell, I have to tell you. <laughs> it's just yeah, right. Right. Yeah. And so, so one of the ways you could clear it, and we just have a conversation when we're done, is, is just literally to identify the age, to identify what happened. You never even have to share it with me. Some people do like to because they can they have a witness for them. And then when they're they're kind of primed and, and we can go into the operating system and do a defrag and literally remove um, viruses and trojans for lack of a better way to describe it, and things that keep people from having full productive lives because they keep hitting this this glitch all the time. And I've worked with everybody from people with PTSD, uh, way back as far as Nam. I mean, my, one of my first clients was a Vietnam vet who mm -hmm. was really, really messed up. And so over the years in working on myself, I've been able to hone this so that sometimes it's just one session and 50 years of issue dissolves. I don't do it. 
I'm really clear it's not Lynn, the person. It's the energy that flows through me. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you call it, Christ, God, Buddha, Allah, doesn't matter. But that Mm -hmm. spiritual force is there and loves us. And when we're ready, we genuinely are ready to do something different in our life, magic happens. And it happened to me over and over and over again. And so I I came to see that this spiritual force always has my back. Mm -hmm. And I can't take, I can't take this gift for for granted. It's been a honed gift. It's, it's, you know, I, I took all those master's degrees after my second husband died in a plane crash. And, um, I just wanted to go back to school and I got accepted to a PhD program at union, you know, where you do your own stuff. Didn't sit with me. Then I went someplace else and I got accepted and, the Pacifica and the, and the cohort, the, the head of it says, well, we're not going to change your spiritual beliefs very much. We're just going to put a new foundation. I said, oh, no, 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 no. Bye-bye. Ooh. And then I got my doctorate, you know, in, in spiritual science, which is the sciences combined with the truths from all the major religions. There is a God. We breathe in, we breathe out. You know, and and that's the basis that this work came to be. And I call it accelerated transformational because, like I say, you don't need 10 years on a couch. You just need to be willing. Mm -hmm. And if the person is willing, then the energy steps in and just lifts them up. Well, that's funny because, you know, I know you're a, a Course in Miracles student like I am. And A Course in Miracles makes it very clear. All you need is a little willingness. Exactly. I love it. I love it. And well, yeah, I was just going to say one of my favorite phrases is the willingness to do gives the ability to do. We don't have to know how. Mm-hmm. We just have to be willing to put one foot in front of the other. And isn't it true that the miracles happen when you're in the I don't know? Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, too, um, each of our spiritual awakenings, uh, some people, of course, go through an entire lifetime without any spiritual awakening, but we have our own paths. For me, it's been a long, slow, progressive unfolding and blossoming slowly, but slowly. And it's, it's been beautiful. Yeah. Um, I do want to ask you also, uh, with all the clients that, that you work with, what, what's the biggest block the one biggest block or one or two biggest blocks that you encounter with clients well it's a really good question i would say what and mostly i work with business owners entrepreneurs because the ones that want to change the world the one thing i notice in common is that at some point the child self was hurt or wounded you can't be a successful business person and i've been work doing this work for close to 40 years if you have residues and a five-year-old is running your business you don't know yeah and um it's really cool because one of my clients is writing a book about how to become a successful entrepreneur and he just told me yesterday that he's i'm in the first chapter and throughout the entire book because i turned his entire um livelihood around and his entire approach to life around and that that's pretty much what happens because the child wound left unaddressed, it it just, it it comes up in the most unusual times. For some people it's anger, for other people they continually are just on the verge of quote success and all their hard work and it's like Sisyphus, everything comes back down and they have to start all over. I call them serial, you know, serial entrepreneurs. And, and just today I had one I've been working with for 16 years. He's done very well, but he had, had an issue that we couldn't quite unlock. And today, today was the day I, I write goals for all my clients that it's better than they can imagine, you know, that, that they have the resources. I, everybody has the resources. We just have to know we have them. Even if we've never, quote, been spiritually aware or awake or interested, that doesn't negate the fact that our soul our spirit is, is orchestrating our life for specific learning. And my experience, because I've helped quite a few people, you know, leave the planet and, and support their families and in the hospital and all. And um, one thing I've noticed throughout the years is that toward the end of life, people start to wake up. 
and they finish all their unfinished business. And we say, oh, they had a wasted life. No, they had an on-purpose life. Everyone has an on-purpose life. And in that place, when you're, when you're ready to pass or you think you're going to pass, oftentimes people get real. They start sharing. They, they call their sons that they've been estranged with for decades. You know, a funny story I heard from my spiritual director. He, he, he had a, someone that worked with him who had a terrible falling out with his dad when he was about 17. And um, he went to Israel and he put a note in the wailing wall and he randomly picked something out of the, the, the wall and it was a letter from his father to him. Randomly he picked a wow. wall? Well, my quote randomly. Yeah, right, right. And it said, son, you know, if you ever read this, know that I love you. I'm so sorry that, that we had this falling out. Please forgive me. His name, the date, and he had passed over. Wow. Isn't that remarkable? I get goosebumps every time I think of how the serendipity is, how our divine intelligence is, how when we get out of our own way, things just happen. Well, as we both know as uh, spiritual students, there are no coincidences or accidents. It's all on purpose. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, again, I, I really was, your, your website's wonderful. I get a lot of information about you. Can, and I, I found this really interesting. Can you tell us a story about how your friend helped you write your mission statement that led you to establish oh. your business? It, it was a nice story. It's, it's every word of it is real. I separated from my husband of 17 years because like my mom, he became bipolar. Um, still love him to this day. We've been divorced more than 45 years. Anyway, I went to um, Santa Barbara and I taught karate and one of my students had moved there and invited me to come visit. So it, it started when I, I went to the local bookstore called Garlands of Letters a book, this is true, it's so weird, fell off the, the shelf and it was, it was wrapped. So I had to buy it because this book fell off the shelf, by gosh, I'm going to see what it is. And it was the first book I read about codependency. Mm. And I, I sat in her trailer. She was in, in you know, school and, and I, we went biking and all that. So that book unlocked my tears. First thing ever unlocked my tears. So then I was connected with a woman who did covers for Narada Records from a friend. We had lunch in a Chinese restaurant and she offered to bring me back to, to LAX. But right in the middle of the meal, she looks at me and she goes, if you could do anything in your life, what would you do? And I think I said in my way, I was like a deer in, in the headlights. What do you mean? I'm a buyer. I work at Giant Stadium. I bought pipes, valves, and fittings for the you know, engineering companies. No, no, no. What would you do if you could do anything? And so I dropped into my heart and out of my mouth came, you know, I'd be a stress management consultant and I'd use all my martial arts principles to help people learn how to navigate their life, you know, like stress management. So she wrote down some stuff on the back of the Chinese placement, folded it up and gave it to me. I just promptly put it in my purse and forgot all about it. So an hour and a half later, I'm on the airplane. And um, sandwich, but the, the center aisles were a little bigger back then. And I'm reading the U.S. Airways magazine, and I start laughing because I'm reading about education. And so the woman next to me goes, what's so funny? I said, oh, my God, they're talking about the state of education and teachers and what they go for. This was way, way, way back. And she goes, oh, that's interesting. I'm an educator. Really? So we talked, and she says, what do you do? And I kid you not, out of my mouth came, I'm a stress management consultant. I help people find a stillness in the busyness of their life, which is a Tai Chi principle. She goes, wow, that's interesting. Um, are you available in, in May, something like May 5th or something? I'm thinking, yeah, I think I could be. And then she goes, uh, what do you charge? I was like, ah, and I... And I was very highly paid in the 70s and 80s because of my karate reputation. So I said, oh, $100 an hour, you know, like I practically gave it away. But and then she goes, um, what else did she say? She said one more thing. And, and she, oh, do you have a business card with you? And I said, no, not on me. So we did a handshake deal. And about um, maybe 
three, four weeks later, after much panic on my side, remember, you don't know what you don't know. Right. I, I went to the library, bought stress management books. I bought books at the bookstore about stress management. And then I thought, well, it's about martial arts. So what am I going to do? And I came up with a, a general idea. When I got there, it was for the Penfield School District in Rochester. I threw everything away. Mm -hmm. And I just allowed the wisdom of my my years of martial arts practice and dealing with stress speak to the to the audience and that was the beginning i've been word of mouth ever mm -hmm. since and that's the grace that i learned i pushed a lot in the martial arts but pushing doesn't do it allowing and flowing and preparing and gaining gaining um more prowess with your body with your mind with your emotions that's what does it so from then on, I started speaking more. I spoke for Bell Telephone, um, Fortune 500 companies. Now, I'm a, I'm a person who was so shy. They used to say, do you have a voice, girl? And now I rarely shut up. <laughs> and that's because I've asked to have the bigger part of me share, not my little ego self. Because my ego could think I know everything. What I know for sure is I don't know anything. And I know where to ask it by going in here. Mm -hmm. wow. So I don't stress like I did. Yeah, it's beautiful wisdom. So, you know, um, Dr. Elena, I, as, as we're all well aware, you know, these are really, really outrageous current chaotic times in our world. How can people, how can the people uh, watching and listening to this incorporate your teachings to maintain a sense of peace and reduce stress right now? It's needed now more than ever. How can they do that? It really truly is. And I can't, there's not one size fits all for sure. Mm -hmm. And one thing I can say for sure is I'm grateful I went through my quote COVID experience where my house burned down, my mother's house burned down, my husband died in a plane crash, my daughter was kidnapped, yada, 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 at that six month interval. And yet I found that I could reach for something inside of me. What's my next step? So I would encourage everyone, if you've lost your house, your home, your business, take a breath. I invite all the listeners right now, just take a breath. And you'll probably find your breathing from up here. And so if you can look at the news as something that will engender fear, if you go to places where it's all about fear and woe is me and the sky is falling, you're going to have that experience. It's, it's quantum physics as well as Course in Miracle. Yeah. And even if you, if you like, there was a time after all those things happened that I got sick. I was diagnosed with Lyme, Epstein-Barr, fibromyalgia, and arthritis simultaneously. Oh, is that all? And it was all emotional. It was totally, right. mm -hmm. our body keeps the score. There's a book by that name, by Van der Kolk, that anything we do not address gets stored in the body. And what I've learned through all these years is that different body parts store different emotions. So for those of the, the listeners that are having back aches, low back aches, you know, their stomachs bothering them, it sounds absolutely crazy but to put a hand on your stomach and say, we're going to be okay. Cause right now you're okay. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, you know, I prided myself on being a runaway. I always took care of myself, but I was living off of quarters when I got sick. Cause I couldn't get out of bed. My husband was dead. My daughter had been napped by her father. And so I just kept praying for a way out. Now I didn't just lay there mindlessly and pray for a way out. I was as proactive as I could be. And serendipity, I call serendipity my best friend, where things randomly seem to happen. But the truth is a woman called me up who heard me do a speech and said, may I hire you to teach me healing? And I thought, wow. I stopped working at my retreat because I wouldn't work with people until I was clear enough. So I marked the following November that if I was ready, I would take my first client. I did that. I booked a lawyer from LA nine months in advance. And I said, I'll let you know. In the meantime, this woman randomly calls me and said, I heard you speak like last spring. I want to learn healing. Can I study with you? She to this day is a fast friend. Mm. They took me in her 80, 
nanny died at 100, but she was in her early 80s, still walked six miles a day and hid Jews in World War II in France. Wow. And so she was an incredible love substitute for a grandma. My friend Claudine became my close friend. She hired me. You know, I wrote my first book, Heaven's Helpful Hints, Does God in Your Soup, predates Chicken Soup for the Souls by quite a few years. And that was the beginning of people who cared about me, random strangers. Half the time I slept at their house because I was, I was really depleted from that 15 round fight with the universe, so to speak. And so taking care of yourself, drinking water, celebrating. I work with people who've immigrated here, don't speak the language, don't have a cent to their name, are living you know, with seven other people in, in, a, you know, in a house. And how are they gonna survive? They found ways to survive. Everyone here on this call wouldn't be listening if they weren't working for ways that worked. The ways that have worked for me is to recognize I'm not Pollyanna, I don't stick my head in the, in the sand, but what can I do right now today that would be something that would give me one itty bitty step out of this mess? Mm -hmm. Is it become an entrepreneur? What skills do I have? Who do I know? You know, where inside of me is this strength, like the mother that picks the car up off the baby? You know, we have that in us. There's more power in a cell probably than an atomic bomb. If we let ourselves know the bigness of us as human beings, we stuff ourselves in these little bodies and pretend we don't know. We've been authority, you know, authority driven. Listen to what the doctor says. Listen to what your boss says. And listen to what your church says. If we would start to not question out of a, hatred but curiosity and fascination wow if if something's going to shift in five years what can i do now to shift me five years down the road what can i do to shift me two weeks down the road you know what can i do i had i had one client who couldn't get a job in a place they showed up every day and volunteered mm -hmm. amazing isn't it and you can tell you you know your listeners i did write a book called um, getting and keeping a job in COVID-19. It's a, a redo of one called Get Clear, Get Connect to Get a Job. If they email me, I'll just send them a copy if they don't have any money. You know, or they can go to Amazon and buy Get Clear, Get Connected or the COVID book. Mm -hmm. Because in the, in the crash back in the late 80s, I, I did a lot of free counseling for middle managed executives that were laid off. They were running out of their benefits and I went in once or twice a month to speak. And so the, the particular book I'm talking about, you can open it to any page. And it's a half a page because stressed people can't read. I couldn't. And it's just a way to like, I call it toilet material. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. attitude. You know? <laughs> I open to attitude. Oh, my attitude needs an adjustment. Yeah. You know, are you open to grief? Are you open to interviewing? And so that's how I helped myself. And that's how I helped those guys. And I would say, stay with your loved ones, celebrate that you have each other. If you lost somebody, celebrate their life. And, and if you have a religious background, whether it's Course in Miracles, Baptist, Jewish, I don't care, find something in your spiritual faith tradition that you can use for you, not against you. God's not punishing anybody. We are all being strengthened. We're being part of a, I like to say, a beginning of another way of life on this planet. Mm -hmm. Because as people go through their trials and tribulations, they're connecting with people. Fathers are spending time with their children. You know, there's, there's so much good, but all we hear is the not good. So I like to keep my eyes on the goodness, that there is a way out. I don't know what it is now, but I'm going to find it. Well, I think uh, one of the key things you said was right at the beginning of that was when you said when you're in a, a dark, stressful place uh, to stop and take a breath. Now, we live in a world where suicide is, is of epidemic proportions and below the radar, really, of the world of how many people really do. And people who commit suicide, um, 
must get in such a dark place that they can't see uh, any light at the end of the tunnel and they can't see any way out. But, but one of the key things to know is that darkness can only obscure the light. It's like having a, a blindfold on and you're walking in a lit area. You can't see the, the light hasn't left. It's just you've blocked it out. And so once you can take that, that deep breath and, and spot that little bit of that little pinpoint of light, it's going to grow. Absolutely. So. And I work a lot with people who have tried to commit suicide or contemplating suicide. And we all have what I call the barking dogs in our head. Yes, you're we do. Loser. You're no good. You're never going to ma- You're better off if you're gone. You, they'll get the insurance. Those are lies. They're barking dogs. We have an operating system installed at birth. When we're in the womb, if our parents are stressed, we literally come up with uh, cellular, they're called effectors and receptors on the surfaces of cells. And we program ourselves for high stress in the womb. So we come out hypervigilant. And if parents have been generationally stressed, what happens is it's passed on to the children through the RNA most frequently so that the psychic trauma is repeated again and again and again. And so if there's a suicide in, in the family, there may be future generations of suicide because that's, that's how it's been programmed. And the way to stop it is to breathe, mm-hmm. is to reach out for somebody, I don't care who it is, even if it's a tree, right? And you start saying, stop it, you barking liars. <laughs> I love that. You know, I've literally had to do that in my own life. I was very suicidal as a young person. I never tried it because I thought I'd mess it up. That's how low my self-esteem was. <laughs> and yet, and yet, I punished myself physically. I mean, I would spar with a broken nose. You know, I had a broken arm one time. The guys were didn't like the fact that there was a woman in this instructor's class. I broke my arm. I didn't stop. I was. I was. I had inured myself. I had so ruled out pain that I could function with a broken arm and and continue. Not smart. If you think you're going to become suicidal, reach out to someone and not someone who says, oh, get it together. Mm -hmm. There's many, many people. And there's a process called free form writing. I'm going to give everybody on this call, I'll give you the link, a free 10... 10 session under 10 minutes a day mini workshop you can do there's something called free form writing you write what you're thinking and you burn it or if you can't burn it over the yeah. sink you shred it that allows the pressure that's building up inside to have a safety valve and mm-hmm. i've done this for over 25 years nothing i talk about is something i haven't done and it's really really helpful even if you ignore the rest of it you know, free form writing is, is a gift. You know, it, it allows the pressure to come off. And, and people that have been in the darkest places and live oftentimes can help others in that place because they know what it's like to hit bottom. And it's a passing thing like this. It's that barking dog gets you in a down moment and you go, yeah, that's a good idea. I think I'll go do whatever I'm going to do. But the second they do it, Rest assured, they go, what was I thinking? Well, they weren't thinking. The barking dogs were thinking. Great. And that's, I think, one of the greatest gifts. Things are never the way they seem. The dogs seem real. You may have heard your whole childhood, you're fat and stupid. You know, I had one client that said, his mother always said, you're going to grow up to be a con man. Oh, you know, talk point. about programming. Wow. And, and the, the, the hurts of our parents are passed on to our children. So by the time we're six months old, we're already being, being, you know, taught, don't do that. I was visiting a a client and she's very self-aware at this point. And the dog was like trying to beg off the little girl in her high chair. And she goes, don't do that dog. And now the little girl goes, goes, oh man, I need to watch what I'm doing. Well, we understand that uh, all of our paradigms for our life are established in us by the time we're, I believe, seven years old. And, and you know, the, uh, many of those paradigms are negative, and some people, unfortunately, they go until they die, and they never get rid of them. And, and yet, you know, Kurt, I have infinite compassion for each soul's journey, 
and what may look like a wasted life may be exactly the curriculum they signed up for. I'll give you a made up example. Okay. Soul decides to come into earth. They cannot understand why negative people just don't get it together. So the board that looks at them before they come to the planet says, yeah, that's a really good idea. You don't have a clue what it is to be dark or negative and not be able to move. Huh, that's a really good suggestion that you have a life like that. You'll learn a lot, you know, and then they're, they're done and they, they go back for their post-life review. And the, the, the board says, so what'd you learn? That wasn't fun at all. Right. You know, yeah. and so we're spiritual beings, eternal. God didn't create junk. Each of us has a specific thing to do. And it's in common with every human being. You know what it is? Breathe in mm-hmm. and breathe out. What's my mission? Breathe in mm-hmm. and breathe out. Pay attention to what you're experiencing. That's how we wake up. That's how the Course of Miracles when I started it way back, like 30, 40 years ago, that's how I began to look at things for the first time. Wow, look at, look at a flower. Like I got two dozen of these for my birthday yesterday. And mm. they're the most fragrant, exquisite rose. Beautiful. And if you can't buy them, if you live someplace, go look at flowers. Yeah. Look at the sunset. Look at the green grass. Look at your fingers. Aren't they amazing? You know, these are the fingers that can get you a job. Wow. Well, to all my viewers and listeners, this is just some phenomenal, phenomenal, beautiful wisdom from Dr. Lynn Morrell. Lynn, we've covered a a lot of ground here. I mean, just amazingly great stuff. And and I do really want to talk about your, your new wonderful book, Beyond Lovelyville. You were kind enough to send me the the uh, pdf version of the ebook and um I've, I've gotten through to page 87 and and it's funny because folks this book is written almost in a childlike way but with adult messages in and i would compare it very similar to the adventures of alice in wonderland meets um um, um uh, the Hobbit, <laughs> you know, and, but with great messages. I mean, how did you come up with this, this beautiful, there's so many great spiritual lessons in there. It's actually autobiographical. Mm, this does not surprise me. Through the, everything in there, I lived through earthquakes, trapped in a room, fires, um, kidnappings, um, loss of health, loss of loved ones. And it came, it's, I started in 2007. And my husband, my, 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 um, he's so abundant. My third husband died of a hospital error. He was a chaplain at UCLA. And we went to the hospital down the street because he'd been uh, in an accident. So I started it because I was at the kitchen table and I said to James, I wonder what a puddle of leaves is. He goes, wow, honey, that's an interesting three words. He goes, start writing. And I went in and I just sat down and I always say a little prayer, you know, tell me what to say. Mm-hmm. And it's like this puddle of leaves and this, this little creature is, is dying of thirst and finds a puddle of leaves. And so it's, it's, it is a parable for self-awareness for adults, but it's for the child in all of us mm-hmm. because it is innocent. I don't preach to anybody because everybody's journey is their way. But the characters discover the answers to their own dilemmas. And that's what's so beautiful about the book. And it took 13 years after James died. I spent 10 years put in the closet. And about, oh, four or five years ago, it was like, finish the book now. People started calling me that had read the first few chapters. Lynn, when is it coming out? What? The book. And so, you know, I finally got it published. And it's touched many, many lives. I gave it to a, a brain in, injured woman that used to be a massive like um, writer for marketing and stuff. She read it five times. And she said each time she read it, she got another piece of herself back. Mm-hmm. And so my intention is that the loving in this book touch people's lives, even if it's one page. There's something in it for everybody. Well, I can say that it's probably the type of book that you could sit down and read from cover to cover and, and not want to stop and, and 
I only stopped because I had to go to bed. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's also the type of book you you could feel free to read this to your children, and the children would love it. They may even pick up on the the, the adult parables, uh, you know, of your uh, personal journey. But how wonderful! Thank you for writing that. I'm loving it. You're welcome. And my 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 beta readers included everything from two ten year olds to a seventy five year old. And the 10 year old is very wise, she's in fifth grade. I said, so how did you like the book? And I just read the last couple you know, uh, pages for her, I opened them at random. And she turned beet red and she goes, it made my heart happy and glad. Yeah. And, then, and, then, and then she said, my sadness went away. 10 years old and the other 10 year old got permission at school to do it as a book report. Nice. Yeah, and so, they probably were singing the song of Lovelyville. And there's music to that. One of my client's friends, director in Italy, when he did a podcast for me, he sat down and he played the lyrics to Lovelyville. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. When I when I get a chance, it, it's going to be out. And my prayer is that it becomes an animated film because there's such goodness in it. Mm -hmm. There's evil. There is negativity in the world. But loving always trumps the darkness. Right. right. You know, and then the, can I share one more wonderful yes. thing? Yeah. My next book is coming out. Target date is July 31st. It's called Loving You. Mm. And it's the love, love emails between my husband and I when um, he was the chaplain at UCLA and he'd send me in lunch, lunch breaks. And we'd, it's poetry, it's real life, and it's right down to four days before he passed away. Wow. He called me the center of his garden of love. What's it called again? It's called Loving You. Wow. I can't it's, our, it's our love emails. And we're, I'm, my target date is um, July 31st, which would be our 15th or 16th wedding anniversary. Mm. Wow. So that, that's, I've read it to people, guys in bad relationships, women in not good relationships. And I open it at random. And invariably the guys go, oh, my God. I had no idea this was possible. Mm -hmm. The woman would go, you mean there's men like this out there? <laughs> yes. Do your work on yourself. You too can attract an amazing relationship with yourself and in the yeah. world. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I have one, one final question and, and I don't want to go too long with, I try to keep uh, the show right around an hour, but I mean, there's just so great, great information here. I saw uh, earlier today, I was, I uh, saw a video of you on YouTube uh, talking about the champion's mindset, which is right in line with my personal motto that or, uh, ordinary people can accomplish extraordinary things. Can, can you briefly talk about a champion's mindset? Well, I would say a champion is curious. They're looking for in, in, incremental improvements. And, and they're really impeccable with their honesty about, did I practice today? Did I push too much today? It's, it's a way of looking at life as though life is for you. And, and I, I delivered that talk probably, I don't know, a long time ago. But the champion gets up one more time than they fall. They, they care front, I learned that word in my grad school, care frontation versus confrontation. Oh, okay. You caringly look at, wow, if I blew that, that like I'll give you a real life story where um, I was in a tournament and the woman was extremely overweight, probably weighed well over 250 pounds and about my size, I was 5'5 five, five at the time. And so I thought, oh, this is gonna be a piece of cake. That woman moved faster that anybody had ever seen. The problem was she, she hit me in the face and drew blood and got disqualified. I went up to her and said, that was the most extraordinarily, excellently executed kick ever. You know, and so I learned from every mistake because that's how we become champions. We take everything as grist for the mill, even the COVID thing. How are we becoming more resilient? How are we becoming more creative? How am I going to feed my family? And, and when you're stressed, you can't. If you're in a ring and you're at all tense, you will lose. Look at Lovell with Apollo 13. They had over 500 manual calculations they had to make. And when I heard his interview, it was stunning. He was just matter of fact. They said, well, didn't you freak out? 
I couldn't afford freaking out. That would waste 10 minutes of our oxygen. So the champion finds ways mm -hmm. over, under, through. And a true champion, a true champion always is win, win, win. They win, the other person wins, and the world or the environment wins. And I would call that the way of the warrior, the way of the lover, the way of the mystic, the way of humankind when we're kind to one another. Wow, that, that is just phenomenal, Dr. Lynn. Uh, I'm going to end it right there. I don't think that I could have a better ending than that. And, and folks, we have been talking to the amazing Dr. Lynn Morell, M-O-R-E-L. Um, Lynn, how can people get a hold of you so that they can uh, learn these things from you and maybe you can help them out with their uh, issues? Well, they can reach out to my virtual assistant. It's va dot dr l i n m o r e l dot com i get so many emails now it's hard for me to keep up mm -hmm. and i must confess there's a few that have gotten lost you know um i have a program called thinkific i am going to send that you that link so if you want you can po post oh, that would it. be awesome yeah yeah because my goal is to have us wake up because kindness begets kindness and it's a really simple tool for beginners or advanced people it's just a different way of looking at life. Wow. I, but I definitely encourage everybody to get contact you. And didn't you say earlier in an earlier career, you worked at Giant Stadium, the baseball stadium? Well, yeah. and the reason I ask that, because we just knocked it out of the park here. <laughs> with, with this <laughs> podcast. This is phenomenal. I'm a baseball fan, and I love that phrase. We knocked it out of the park today. You did. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lynn Morell. I'm Carl Gruber right here on World of Awakenings. Uh, uh, Dr. Lynn, namaste. Namaste. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Take what fits and leave the rest. This has been another episode of World Awakenings, the fast track to enlightenment with your host, Carl Gruber, a certified Law of Attraction life coach. We welcome you to tune in each and every episode of this podcast, World Awakenings, as we open your mind, your heart, and your eyes to the fact that all the world's population is now, more than ever, awakening to the truth of all things metaphysical and spiritual, and just how they play an all-important role in our moment-to-moment -moment everyday life. Much love and light to you, my friend. Thank you for tuning in.